if, if you take out your bulletin, you'll see it said, another name besides mine presenting the message this morning. That was my grandson, Andrew Chacon. He's a TLT leader, and he's going to help present this message with me. And unfortunately, he couldn't be here this morning, but he sent the messages that he was going to speak to me, and I will try and do my best to substitute and speak the part for him. I do want to take a moment to present to you what happened last week in Omaha, Nebraska. The Pathfinders were up there for, what were they up there for? Five Pathfinder Bible experience. And just to make it known what happened up there, they took the first place ranking again, and now they will be advancing on to Orlando, Florida in April 26th, I believe it is, 25th. The Lord has really blessed these teams. The Lord is hiding his word in their hearts. And I cannot help, every time I see these children and what they're, the Lord is doing with them, that I cannot help but go back to the passage in the Spirit of Prophecy that says the Lord is preparing a mighty army of youth to finish the last day message. And if that is not happening now, I must be blind. This is a, this is a little video that Andrew put together. Uh, and the conference has got a hold of it now, and the conference is passing it around. And Andrew, just he's being blessed, and he just wants to be used by the Lord in every way possible. So if you can play that video now, Eddie, please. Could you please state your name for the camera? My name is Shelby Clark. Hi, my name is Emmett Reed. My name is Dakota Lee Godfrey. I am Edwin Chavez. So when you hear the word Pathfinder or Pathfinders in your club, what do you what comes to mind? Pathfinders. What does it all really mean? Is it just people, places, clubs, cities, states, conferences, divisions, countries? To others, it's more than that. We are one body, one people, one person, all in the hands of He, Jesus. Really, we have this feeling, this compassion, this touching, this, this loving person out there, his name is Jesus. What do you think of it? Well, immediately, I think of, you know, of course, the Pathfinder Club. Um, you know, it's a worldwide organization. But then, uh, whenever, you know, whenever you really think about it, what a Pathfinder is, we are followers of the way. It's, you know, an abnormal thing to most people in the world today. Uh, the way we believe and why we do what we do, uh, the way we act. And so, I believe that, you know, as Pathfinders and as Adventists, we are followers of how has PBD affected you and your team, like personally? Well, we have we have fun. Like they always joke around. We always joke around with each other. Um, some of our teammates would say, "You know what? It's just fun. Like it's affected us so much. We've gotten closer, and some of us still like don't like each other, but you know that's how teams." Well, this has kind of been like a huge part of my life ever since I was 10. Um, so when I was five, I always wanted to be a Pathfinder. Like just, I saw a picture of a Pathfinder in a magazine, and I was like, wow, they have a cool uniform, and they, they march cool.
Pat Finders to me is more than just clubs and conferences and just other people coming together. It's just a church united in God's way and word and just all the youth of this church uniting together. Pathfinders is more than just people and friends. It's Jesus hands and feet into the world. It's more than anybody could ever think it could do. In making of this film, I was asking myself, what can I do? What's the creative flow I can use to explain just how Pathfinders is affecting these children, this youth, this church, this country? And I just said, I don't know. It's Jesus that He's the only way that we can ever explain things. Have you learned anything from the past four or so years you've been in Pathfinders? Or um, anything? I'd say the thing that I've learned the most is that through God, all things are possible. I found out that he had made this. I was uh, I was a little astonished, and I, I was I couldn't say anything for a minute. The Lord has had His hand on it, Andrew, for quite some time. It's hard to see sometimes, but when he was just a young child, went to a, a garage sale, and Michelle couldn't find him. But yet, they looked around for a second, and the people that was having the garage sale, they had a young child out there in a crib beside them, and Andrew was knelt down beside that crib praying for that baby. If the Lord is not preparing young people nowadays to forgive the end message, I don't know what's happening. I think we all need to wake up. I've entitled the message this morning, what do we value? How many brought their Bibles to church? Hold them up for me, please. Okay. How many brought an electronic device? <laughs> okay. Excuse me here a minute. What happens if that electronic device goes dead? What happens if you have to flee? And you don't have a chance to, you don't want that electronics device on you because we're going to be hunted down in the last days that the Christians will be. What are you going to do? Where is the word going to be? It's going to be, it's going to be in your heart, in your mind. Okay, put your Bibles away. Put them away. Take out the back of your bulletin right here. Take out a pencil. Write down where you would find the three angels' message. As they say in Pat PBE, be precise. Because someday you'll be called before magistrates and, and courts. You might even be put in prison. And you'll have to know your word. Remember the fill in the blanks to keep it, okay? Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall honor me. Where do you find that passage? Okay, and one last one. Refrain their voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded, and thy children shall come again to thine own border. How many of us have children here that are not in church? You would like them to be in church? That's a promise God has made to you that they will be. You pray that prayer, you live your life in accordance to 
to his commands and his leading by the Holy Spirit. And you may not see it before you go to your rest if time lasts. But trust in the Lord and you'll see the fruition. This morning, I want to dedicate this, this uh, message this morning to God the Father and the Son and especially the Holy Ghost who lives within us. Our Bibles, I want you to go home and check those out and see what you, see if you had those all put down. How many felt comfortable about the answers they had? How would you feel comfortable if you had to leave your Bible then, if you didn't have the messages in, hidden in your heart? Those are pretty relatively simple passages that we should all know. This is a survey that was taken by the Barnum Group for the American Bible Society. It says more than half of Americans think the Bible has too little influence on a culture they see in a moral decline. Yet only one in five Americans read the Bible on a regular basis, according to a new survey. More than three quarters of Americans, which is 77%, think the nation's morality is headed downhill, according to a new survey from the American Bible Society. The survey showed the Bible still firmly rooted in American soil. 88% of respondents said they own a Bible. 80% think the Bible is sacred. 61% wish they would read, read the Bible more. And the average household has 4.4 Bibles. I know Adventists have a lot more than that. So, but if they do read the, the Bible, the majority, which is 57%, and only read their Bibles, take a guess, how many times a year? Now, this is a survey. They have nothing to lose by answering. How many times do you think they read the Bible a year? How many? That's a good guess. It's close, but it's actually a lot less than that. Pardon? That's on the opposite side, but actually it's four, four times a year. Only 26% of Americans said they reached, read their Bible on a regular basis, which means four or more times a week. That's pretty, that's pretty sad. The Barnum Group con conducted this, uh, this study, the State of the Bible, for the American Bible Society using 1,005 telephone interviews and 1,078 online surveys with a margin of error for the combined data of plus or minus two percentage points. What was even more disturbing about it is this fact. Younger people, being the millennials nowadays, also seem to be moving away from the Bible. A majority, 57% of those ages, 18 to 28, read the Bible less than three times a year, if at all. Those are pretty terrible things to think about. So what do we value? What do we really value? We value our freedom, our religious freedom. Do we value God's word enough to hide it in our hearts? I think we should. I've always thought that I had a, a pretty good understanding of the scripture and had some hidden in my heart. But I look at these kids nowadays, church, and I'm, I'm rebuked. I am really rebuked. I've seen in this last month, January 6th, we had that Pathfinder Bible experience here. Some of those kids were reciting whole chapters at a time and not even looking. They don't even think anything. They're like telling a story. And that puts me to shame. That puts each of us to shame. So I think we all need to put a little bit more effort into what we're doing. I know I do. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit takes up his residence within each one of us. Then the struggle really begins. Our struggle is not with our own flesh. There's an enemy who seeks to destroy our faith and render us ineffective for, or shut us down. He constantly probes to find our weak points and, and uses them for his purposes. In other words, he wants to put us to sleep. Peter also writes, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your, your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Just as a note, where does it say in the Bible 
that the devil is walking by as a roaring lion. Where? First Peter, right. More exact? First Peter 5, 8. Now, Angie would have told you also, he said, before we accepted Jesus Christ, the devil and his evil spirits had us pretty much where they wanted us and left us pretty much alone. When we accepted Jesus, a spiritual battle began. And as we began to grow in maturity and responsibility, the battle became more intense. The enemy of our soul does not give up so easily, and the greater a threat we become to him, the more intensely he will fight. Just a little side note about Andrew again, and I'm not just prompting him up, but just telling you how the Holy Spirit works in these kids' lives. I don't like my tools messed with in my garage. I'm sure Mike and some of the rest of us are the same way. Vicki happened to go outside because she hadn't seen Andrew in the yard when he was a young child for a while. She just happened to peek in the garage for a second, and there was Andrew wanting to get into my tools, and he walked back and forth, walked back and forth. Finally, he said, Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. <laughs> <laughs> and he walked out of the garage. Oh, for the, for the faith of a little child. Uh, due to the general affluence of the Western societies that we're living in and the religious freedoms we are, are enjoying here, few Christians in the West truly know what it means to suffer for their faith. We're busy enjoying our privileges, our lifestyles, and more. Now, Andrew, would he sent this to me again. He says, and while most Western Christians accept the idea of self-sacrifice, many seem ill-prepared for what the gospel actually re requires of them. Rather than the saints showing up for the work of ministry, we're witnessing the rise of an army of fragile Christians who would rather cling to privilege than carry their cross. The church is now witnessing this phenomenon known as comfortable Christianity. And with it comes, are we seeing that in our church today? How about complacency? And moreover, tolerance. Rather than the thus plain, thus saith the Lord, it's either just to look the other way and just go on and, Lord, I'm doing my part, you take care of the rest of them. And it should not be that way. You can almost hear that little whisper on your shoulder saying, shh, don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. You know what happens if you rock the boat? Some of you have seen a slide like this before. Compromise, complacency, and tolerance, but there's no time. There's really no time, and even more, no time now to put up with it. We cannot. Thus saith the Lord, and thus saith the Lord only. Amen? Amen. A lot of things are happening, coming into churches, being brought in that should not be. The Lord says, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from, from the things which, which are written in this book. Take note of that text because you're going to be asked later on. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, finish it for me, church. I will vomit you out of my mouth. I don't want the Lord to say that to me. I don't want him to say that to me. There's a time of trouble coming upon us like it's never happened before throughout the Bible, throughout any mankind. And are we ready for it? At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. And unless the Lord has shortened those days, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake whom he chose, he has shortened those days. So how are we preparing for this time? 
We are called to give what? Three angels' message. Are, we, are you and I prepared to be instant in season and out when somebody asks us for a reason? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. How many denominations nowadays are, are taking away from the, the thus saith the Lord? I'm seeing so many things in churches. I know one of Vicky's cousins, a very brilliant man. I won't name the church he went to, but he said, I only believe the red letter words of the Bible. I said, but I mentioned his name. I said, but those red letter words, a lot of them that Jesus spoke were words from the Old Testament and moreover. And he said, I still just remember them. He brought in some more things. And I said, where do you find that in the Bible? He said, well, it's not in the Bible. It's Greek mythology. So how do you add Greek mythology to God's word? It goes back to what's happening. We're adding to and taking away. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense. King James says, an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You know what? God has called you for a purpose. He's put us each here for this time that we're living in. I cannot rely on Kenneth to answer for me when somebody asks a question. I can't go to him and say, if you wait a minute, I'll go get Kenneth. Kenneth can answer that for me. Just likewise, Kurt can't answer the same thing and say, I'll go get somebody else and they'll answer it for you. The opportunity has been put there for you at this time and the Lord wants us to answer for him. So how do we handle temptations, the opportunities, the anxieties, the dangers, and the fears? How do we discern error from truth when we hear it? Are we storing up God's promises, his warnings, his stories of encouragement in our hearts? Now, I asked some people to read some things for us. And Neil, would you pass this mic around, please? Uh, whoever had Second Peter two four, please, and Cheryl. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them That's into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Okay, we're, uh, is that Second Peter? Yeah. Uh, Second Peter two four. Okay. That's us. Uh, okay. Uh, who had Isaiah 33, 16? He shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. How many remember Pastor O'Leary when he was a pastor here for those many years? How many times did we hear that promise coming from his lips up here? And again, how many times did we not even have to look at our... We, as before we could even get turned to our Bible, Pastor Verber was quoting that, that verse. So many verses stored up in his heart and in his mind. Such an encouragement to all of us. Who has Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17? Thus says the Lord, refrain your voice from, from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work shall be rewarded, says the Lord, and they shall come back from the land of the enemy. There is hope in your future, says the Lord, that your children shall come back to their own border. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, who had that one? Wherefore... <clears throat> Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape, 
that ye may be able to bear it. Amen. So how do we handle temptations, opportunities, anxieties, dangers, and fears? Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance those texts in our hearts. And as we apply them in our lives, we have the comfort that we need. Eddie, would you play that next video, please? This is a man that I want you to uh, hold off for just a second, Eddie. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Bouncing. And first I want to give... I just like to always introduce the... I want to thank our friends from uh, uh, Voice of the Martyrs out of Bartlesville, Oklahoma, for giving me the, the rights to show this in our church. Uh, this is about a man in Laos, communist Laos, who's undergoing many problems. His name was Bounchin. He was on the career path to success. He had a good job as an assistant to the Communist Party uh, leader. But then he met the Christians and was intrigued by their enthusiastic worship. Later, he met Jesus himself. Bouchon was so thrilled about his newfound faith that he began to share it freely. But his new allegiance was not welcomed in communist Laos, where loyalty to the party is all important and ancestors are worshipped as gods. Bouchon lost his job, his place in the community, and finally his freedom in 1999. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison for telling others about God after the authorities had forbidden his evangelical work. While in prison, he was tortured, he was beaten, starved, locked in stocks, and con condemned to solitary confinement for weeks. But Bouchon, those, who, but Bouchon, those weren't their worst punishments. He was cut off from his family, friends, and anyone who could encourage him when he felt his lowest. Most of all, he craved God's living word, the scriptures that inspired his passion for Jesus. How could he survive prison without it? Okay, Eddie. I don't know why they didn't shoot me. The interrogations are the only time I am out of solitary. I am losing hope and fear I have been forgotten. I recite Bible verses to myself, but the words are getting harder and harder to remember. I can handle the torture, the starvation, but I desperately need my Bible. Every day I pray over and over for God to give me a Bible. Now I have my chance. The interrogations have ended and the guards trust me to go into the jungle to gather firewood. Working as fast as I can, I will collect two days' worth of firewood. I'll bring one bundle back. i leave the second bundle in the woods. This is what I need to do. It is very risky, but God is answering my prayer. I will risk everything to have a Bible.
I don't want to leave my wife, but I have to or she will be in danger. Leaving her is so hard. God has answered my prayer. I have a Bible, but I must be careful. They found my Bible, but I would not give up. I will bring in more Bibles. I will read God's word every chance I get. Then the letters came. Letters from me. Letters from Christians all over the world. God not only answered my prayer for a Bible. He let me know I am not forgotten. ขอบคุณพระเจ้าขอบคุณอันดับพี่น้องทั่วโลกที่อธิษฐานอ่อนวอนเพื่อโอ้และก็มู่คู่ที่น้องเยตุคุกและก็ขอบคุณพระเจ
when he was tempted, when things came up. It is written. In fact, I really enjoyed those phrases. It is written. The servants of Christ were prepared no set speech to present when brought to trial. Their preparation was to be made day by day in treasuring up the precious truths of God's word and through prayer, strengthening their faith. When they were brought into trial, the Holy Spirit would bring in to their remembrance the very truths that would be needed. I got to pause here for a second and find it. Mike said something the other, in his last message or sometime when it was, but he had to stop when he was in the truck and write something down. Well, you're not the only one, Mike. I might be eating supper at home, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit puts a thought in my mind, and I have to grab my napkin and write things down. So I just want to let Mike know he's not the only one that has to write things down, whatever he finds. Daily under striving to know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, would bring power and efficiency to the soul. The knowledge obtained by diligent searching of the scriptures would be flashed into the memory at the right time. But if any had neglected to acquaint themselves with the words of Christ, if they had never tasted the power of his grace in trial, they could not expect that the Holy Spirit would bring his words to their remembrance. They were to serve God daily with undivided affection and then trust him. I looked for this passage a week and a half ago, and I knew I heard it many, many times, and I've got the program on my computer, uh, and I just I was looking for it, but I wasn't putting the words in exactly as they were, and I couldn't find it. But you know who I had to turn to to find it? Pastor Larry. And Larry gave it to me. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a ter terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from enemies of the faith. And at that time, the superficial conservative class, now remember when she was writing this, this back in her time, superficial, the conservative class they were looked at, but they were superficial, whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work, will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. These apostates will then manifest the most bitter enmity, doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren, to excite indignation among them. This day is just before us. The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. How will it be tested? I can't be tested. Gary can't do my testing for me. Steve can't do my testing for me. I have to be tested. They will be placed in circumstances where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. Many will be called to speak before councils and in courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. The experience which would have helped them in this emergency had they, they have neglected to obtain, and their souls are burdened with remorse for wasted opportunities and neglected privileges. Broad is the way, narrow is the gate. I wish my brother... Lonnie was here. But I, Lonnie, if you're watching this later on, I hope you're, I'm here with you in spirit. I know you're a professional pilot. You've been a professional pilot. There are other pilots in the room. Uh, Dr. Jess and Jesse have been pilots as well as myself. Piloting, piloting or pilotage is the definition in the air or land. Navigation is navigating using fixed points of reference on the sea or on the land using with reference to a nautical chart, aeronautical chart, or topographic map to obtain a fix of the position of the vessel, or its aircraft or land traveler with, re with respect to a desired course or location. I went through my private training. I've, you've, some of you have heard the, a little bit about this if you were here uh, two prayer meetings ago, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper about this. I went through my private, and I was so in, I loved flying so much, I went through the commercial training as well. This is the main runway at the time at, run, at Joplin Regional Airport, which is runway 13, and the reciprocate would be 31. I know Jess is flown out of there also. You would fly by a chart. You get in there, nothing looks the same. You don't know where you're at. You have to pick your way across 
plotting a course. This is called a sectional. This is used by VFR or visual flight rules. You can see the different things on there. I can't pick them out. You can see little triangles. Those are obstructions or, or high points and the altitude, altitude of those are beside them, the height, the elevation. And it, there's VORs, radio navs on there too that you have, the frequencies. But in times of bad weather, where you don't see, you can't, you have to get above the clouds, you rely on a map such as this. And that map, I, I want to say is just like this book. That is my lifeline. That is my lifeline. Each one of those blue lines are called Victor Airways or Federal Airways. All the major air carriers use those to fly on. If, if you've ever flown, you, chances are you've flown on each one of those somewhere along the line. And as you get in closer to the airport, you'll be handed off to approach control. And there are several different types of approaches to an airport, but one that I'm going to focus on this, this morning is an ILS approach or an instrument landing system. It's all by radio navigation. When you're learning to fly by instruments, your instructor will take you out and he puts on your head what's called a hood. You can see nothing but the panel of your instruments in, in the forefront. And you take off on the runway, strictly by instruments, climbing through the clouds, and you eventually land back on, on, the, on the runway with your instruments. You have to trust your instruments totally. As you're going through that training, the instructor will tell you to put your head down, your chin on your chest, take your feet off the rudders, your hands off the yoke, and just let him control the airplane. And he will put the airplane in such a minor configuration that you don't even know it's being moved. Inside your ear are three canals with little hair follicles inside with fluid in them, and they tell us when we're being moved around or anything. That's why when you have an ear infection, if you seem dizzy in a lot of times. But that instructor will take you and he will put you into a, an attitude where you're actually in a pretty steep bank. But it's such a gradual change, kind of like what's happening in our churches nowadays, and we're not even really aware of it if we weren't following the Bible. And then all of a sudden he'll jerk the attitude of that plane back to normal flight. And your first thing, then he'll say, your airplane. And you respond to my airplane, which means you have the control. What you don't realize, your inner ear is telling you that you're in a steep bank one way or the other. And you might be in, in, a, in a downward spiral. Your first instinct is to jerk back on the yoke. And you'll think that you're jerking back to a level five, but you're actually jerking to a steep bank to one way or the other. And then you're confused because it seems all the different. And you're confusing is what causes many pilots to go to their grave. You have to learn the absolute total trust in your instruments. This people is what we need to trust totally, absolutely. There's not one time in my training when I'm coming through the clouds and I'm being cleared for approach to Joplin. I'm coming down through the clouds and I've intercepted what's called the localizer on the ILS approach, which is a radio beam shooting right down that runway. As I'm looking down, my instruments are saying I'm, I've intercepted that localizer and I'm turning on that localizer and I need to intercept the outer marker. This might seem all Greek to you, but it will come into play here in a minute. Once I've intercepted that outer marker, there are three markers, the outer, the middle, and the inner marker. I'm listening for the Morse code identifier that says I'm over that outer marker. Then I begin my descent on what's called the glide slope. It's, it's usually a three degree down slope, down. And you'll follow your instruments down. And if you stay on that glide slope, it'll bring you right down to the runway. And you stay on that localizer. You're still going down through the clouds. As you're standing in altitude, you're getting, you're getting closer to the ground. And in Joplin, on this particular approach out here, there's a, what's called a decision height of 200 feet. If you have not seen the lights of the runway by 200 feet, you declare a missed approach and go around because 
by the time you spill your engine back up, you, have, you might not get out on time. So you're still looking at here. And there's, you're wondering, is my instruments right? Am I trusting my instruments? My instruments have told me I'm right. Do I still trust them? And you're still looking. You're still looking. And you're seeing that altimeter go around. Your height is going down. And you're, you're wanting more and more. There's a time, I know if Lonnie was here, I wish Lonnie could tell a little bit more about it. I'd give him the mic and let him tell some of the things that you're feeling. You feel in your a gut, a tightness in your gut sometimes. Are my instruments right? Not to mention, I forgot to mention, when you're coming through the clouds, you might be experiencing a lot of turbulence. So your aircraft is doing like this, and you're trying to maintain that, that position. Then all of a sudden, you see that. Can you pick it out? A little bit of the lights on the runway. Then drop another 100 feet, a little bit more visibility comes in. You feel a little bit better. Then a little bit more until right there over the threshold you see the runway in your home. What we're going through now, folks, we're going through these times right now. We're coming through those clouds. And the only way to get to the runway is to trust your Bible, trust the scriptures. We cannot go with the things that are happening in our churches. Things are coming in, are being allowed to come in. That's throwing us off course. If I get one degree off course over a distance, over a certain distance, I will not get to my destination. That's what I want to see. I want to see heaven. I want to see that runway. I'm talking in pilot terms, but it's the same to all of us right now. We've got a job to do, and we've been doing it pretty faithfully. We started a ministry here back in 2013, sitting up here on the front row of the pew. That ministry was, was just supposed to be for shut-ins and the elderly, taking them a DVD, but the Holy Spirit had more things planned for that ministry. Little by little, the church bought the camera and through Jim setting up the web page, the Joplin's web page for the church, which you'll see here in a minute also. This is what's been happening. This is the 2018 report for the World Watch List of the most persecuted countries, the most dangerous to be a Christian in. And the ministry started here. You would think the Lord would use 3ABN, Hope Channel, and more to get the message out. But the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, is leading people to this little church here and the messages that are out there. And I'm really in awe of what's happening. These are some of the countries. Any guy, anybody have any idea how many countries the messages are going to? Anybody want to take a guess? How many? You're close. You're really close. He said 200. How many? Well, that's a little bit high, but it's a, it's a little bit less than 200. But each one of these columns represents 20 countries. And you'll see the color indicated by the most severity of the persecution. There's another 80. So we're up to what? 160? 177 countries that the Lord is using the Alpha Church to get the message into. I don't claim to answer, know how many people are actually benefiting from these, but I know the message is going in this many countries. What's this say? And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. These are some of the most viewed sermons that have been online. And you, as you can see, the Antichrist and the Three Angels message take up the uh, majority of it. And then a great deal of them were from when Brother Eric Wilson was here back in November. And his message is here. These are some, we're getting comments from these, from these different sermons. And these are some of the comments. How is the Seventh-day Adventist church different than Baptist churches? It is such a blessing I'm being blessed. Thank you so much for uploading these videos. I pray all of you are doing well. What are the characteristics of Babylon? What do we have to avoid? That was from one of your sermons, Brother Larry. 
Send more information, please, Brian. God bless you, amen, and our Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. I like getting involved in things that have to do with learning more about God. And I had to get with uh, Regina and make sure I was getting this translated right. Says, I heard this is the real church. And this one, when I die, where will my soul go and my spirit? These are truths. These are fundamental truths that are not in the, in the churches out in the secular world now. They're, when you die out in one of those other churches, you go, you're preached right into heaven. But he's learning the truth. We answer you, the truth. We answer the message of how they ask it. But we also send them this. Thank you for contacting us on Messenger. Here are other valuable resources which you may enjoy. The church's webpage contains many valuable links as well as a 24-hour live feed of an associate ministry, Amazing Facts. And you can view that in the portal there on the page. Also available is the church's YouTube channel found at Job and SDA. Should you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact us here either through Messenger or by calling the church in this information there. You can see all these messages on joplinsdachurch.org which Jim had set up and now Jared is taking over and, or the YouTube channel or also on Google Plus or the Facebook pages of Joplin SDA Church Joplin Seventh-day Adventist Church Eddie would you bring up the uh, YouTube channel please how many have been to the YouTube channel not very many Okay, this is what you'll see when you first bring it up. You'll see that man in the blue shirt. He's doing a trailer. Would you play that trailer quick, Eddie, please? Are you open 15 to 16? That's right, yes. First of all, do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired and authoritative word? It is the standard for truth and the source from which all the teachings on this channel are derived. There are four C's that help explain some of our foundational beliefs. The first is Christ. Jesus Christ is God the Son, part of the eternal Godhead. His role in creation and redemption of mankind is central. Salvation only comes through him, and our goal is to lift Jesus up so that he may draw all people to himself. The second is the cross. The crucifixion of Jesus is the pivotal event in history. As the Lamb of God, Jesus' sacrificial death paid the price for our sins. His intervention purchased our redemption. Third, the commandments, the Ten Commandments written on tablets of stone God's own finger are unchanging, representing God's eternal character. They will continue to be the code for living in his eternal kingdom. And fourth, the second coming. The return of Jesus is soon and imminent. It is imperative that we prepare ourselves and others to be ready to meet him. We have a special commission to herald the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 as a warning message of hope for all. So be sure to tune in each week as new sermons will be available for viewing. Our prayer is that the proclamation of God's word will inform, inspire, encourage, and transform all who hear. So we invite you to find out what God is wanting to share with you today on the job. this time we have 96 full-time subscribers to the channel and this is all around the world as you'll see there's past five streams that was the uh, revelation seminar then the uploads each week are on those there scroll down a little bit more Eddie you'll see the seminar that Eric Wilson had and of course links that are suggested that we can point them on to and of course health institutes and all all kinds of Adventist mission stories. If you've not been on that channel, I strongly suggest that you 
that you find time to explore it. And you can point other people to it. Eddie, would you bring up the, uh, the church's webpage now, please? Gong Show. My grandfather was on the gong show and he... This is what you'll see when you first bring it up. And you can expand that portal so you can see it in, in full screen. But moreover, they have 24 hours a day they have an access to godly, Bible-filled preaching from Amazing Facts. Hey, would you take it back, Eddie? One. So... I have a very unusual family. Did I mention okay, that? Okay, on the... Uh, As a matter of fact, every... Also, really, we're just on the weekly sermons. You can find the weekly sermons up there. You can find whatever month you want. You can archive all the way back to our beginning. All the way back. You can find the sermon there and play it. Back to the top, Eddie. Religious re resource links. How many people have Spirit of Prophecy books in, on their shelves at home? Quite a few. Still some need to be there. But if you don't have them, go here to the web page. Click on the link here. And they're all there. The books, the devotionals, pamphlets, manuscripts, they're all there. All you do is uh, go ahead and click on the books on the top right, right there, Eddie. Just click on Acts of the Apostles. And on, then you can start reading from the very beginning. Or if you went to the contents, you can pick the very chapter you want. Now, I'm running a little bit over on time, but I thought it was important that you see these. This isn't all. You can, and I'm going to quit right here, but you can also go to Google+. Plus. There's also that, that web page for all the uh, uh, sermons are there. Okay, you scroll down, Eddie. You can see them all there, and it's also in association with them amazing facts there but we're also on Facebook and I want to read that one verse that from 2 Peter 1 verse uh, 4 by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust those promises his word it's our hope it's our guarantee. It's our lifeline. Do not give it up. Store it in your hearts, please. Please. And let's have our closing song now. Seek.